All right, I think we'll get started here. Um, some people may still be filtering in, but they'll, they'll get caught up pretty quickly. Anyway, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today for this community conversation on Yellowstone River monitoring, water monitoring in general. Um, anyone, uh, my name is Max Yortsberg. I'm the conservation director with Park County Environmental Council, and we are your local nonprofit environmental advocacy organization working to protect and preserve our water, wildlands, wildlife, and the people who make up this great community. I don't think anyone here needs me to tell you that we live in an amazing place and that our water resources are world-class. Um, in fact, uh, the home I grew up in drew its water directly from Pine Creek until we uh, finally installed a well, which mainly meant that we'd have water throughout the winter that wouldn't freeze solid uh, for two months. Um, but you know that water was so good that we we literally could drink from the source. Um, and so I mean I think that that that's a good example of uh, how great this resource is. Um, and I think we're really fortunate to be able to uh, steward this resource. And it, and with that comes a pretty good responsibility in my opinion because we're situated at the headwaters of the nation and 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 in the bigger picture. And all of us in Park County were the most upstream users of Yellowstone's water. Uh, Yellowstone National Park protects everything upstream from us. So in many ways, we have an obligation uh, to take care of that resource since we're really the first in line to receive it. Um, we here at PCC, we firmly believe that the health of our community and the health of the ecosystem are inseparable. And with the effects of drought, climate change, population growth and development, we can't simply trust that everything's okay and that it's gonna be okay. Uh, and that's where we rely on research and analysis and monitoring projects being carried out in the upper Yellowstone uh, to guide us and to um, help us find ways to, you know, not only continue to ensure that the water resource is of the highest quality, but um, that we can continue using it in a thoughtful and, 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 and respectful way. Um, so that's what brings us here today. Uh, we're joined by the folks from Yellowstone Ecological Research Center uh, who are gonna talk to us today about their river and water monitoring program called RiverNet. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Tori who's gonna introduce the RiverNet program. Um, and just uh, for everyone to know, if you can continue to stay on mute while you can to minimize interruptions. Um, and if you have any questions, comments, feel free to put them in the chat. We'll try to address them as we go through uh, the presentation, uh, but we'll definitely get to them at the end where there'll be a, a short Q&A period. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to the folks at Yerk. And thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Hi, thanks, Max, um, and thanks to uh, Park County Environmental Council for sponsoring this conversation. Um, I'm going to do a screen share really quickly, and then I'll get started with my part. Uh, all right, um, so as Max mentioned, um, my name is Tori Dilley. I joined York this past spring to support uh, development and communication efforts. And I live in Livingston, so it's been really wonderful getting to know many of you um, through conversations about uh, this wonderful resource that we share. So here at York, we're really excited to share about the current status of our RiverNet program on the Upper Yellowstone watershed. And for those of you who aren't familiar uh, with RiverNet, we are in our fourth year, including a pilot study, and we're currently providing monitoring on water quality and quantity at the tributary level. And so our goal with this program, as it fits into our mission and our other monitoring programs, is to provide information that the community can use for adaptive decision making. So we're really excited to share this with you and get feedback, uh, because this is a community driven program. So just kind of an overview of what our presentation is going to look like. I'm going to share about a little bit of the history, uh, the purpose and the science behind the program. 
I'm going to hand it over to Robbie Roberts, who's going to introduce our RiverNet application um, and kind of do a feature function walkthrough where you can ask him questions about how our program works for data sharing. And then I'll hand it over to Bob Crabtree, who will talk about some really exciting next steps for RiverNet. And as Max mentioned, we'll have space for questions at the end, but if you wanna pop some questions in the chat, particularly when Robbie's doing his walkthrough, that'd be really great as well. So I don't wanna to spend too much time on this as Max just did a great job kind of emphasizing the importance of our water resources. I think anyone tuning in is definitely interested in the health of our watershed and our resources in Park County. And we know that the Yellowstone River is critical not only for our human communities, but for our wildlife communities. And watersheds connect our communities. So as you know, Max mentioned, we're at the headwaters of a really critical watershed. And unfortunately, water resources are going to continue to be a key issue. Um, we're looking at drought, development, climate impacts, um, this was really highlighted in the Greater Yellowstone Climate Assessment and experienced by all of us this summer. We faced record low flows, high temperatures, we experienced fishing restrictions, and our water resources were really stretched. So what do we do about it? Monitoring is really critical to understand these changes and to allow us to be adaptable as a community. Um, but too often, data collection is limited uh, spatially and temporally, and lacks community involvement. There can also be a delay in releasing information from agencies. So by the time a report comes out, that information might be irrelevant or not used to the, its greatest effect. So where does RiverNet uh, play in? So success for the RiverNet program on the Upper Yellowstone looks like verified and trusted data that's collected and shared regularly as part of a long-term monitoring program. We're looking for an engaged and empowered community that is not only participating in the collection of the data, but it's also accessing that data uh, to make conservation decisions. We're also looking to drive innovation and technology to advance conservation science, particularly as it applies to drought management. I know this is a really hot topic in Paradise Valley and Park County. So just briefly, and I think Bob's going to touch on this a little bit as well, but RiverNet was an outcome of the Envision Yellowstone Summit. And throughout the process, uh, we've relied heavily on community involvement, um, not only in prioritizing tributaries for monitoring, um, but also for water quality sampling sites. We've received support from Microsoft, TopCoder, AMB West Philanthropies, Patagonia, um, and our wonderful adopt a river donor community, as well as Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. So we're so grateful for the support um, that's really helped us grow this program. We also have some key partners I wanna mention. So that's Trout Unlimited, PCEC, Western Sustainability Exchange, uh, Montana DEQ and Fish, Wildlife, and Parks, uh, Top Coder, and uh, MSU Department of Computer Sciences. We have a whole network of really awesome students that have been supporting us on this project as well. So just a little bit of background on how the data is collected before we get to the platform and how you can access the data. So RiverNet data is collected and verified by our trained field techs um, and our protocols are DEQ approved. Water quality monitoring occurs regularly throughout the summer and into early fall. And water quantity monitoring is collected in near real time from our sensor stations. So we have 16 sensor stations um, throughout the watershed. And those sensor stations are Bluetooth enabled. So what that means is someone can walk up and download the data that then gets uploaded to our platform. Community involvement is really critical for this program. Um, you know, with COVID, we've not had as many citizen scientists working with us as we would have liked. So we're really interested in getting more community involvement, um, including students from local schools, which we've used in the past. Um, and anyone who's interested in being a part of this project to collect data. So the data that's currently available on the platform, um, we've got discharge from 16 fixed sensor stations, um, helping us with our water quantity measurements. And then we have 26 sampling sites for water quality where we're measuring 
nitrate, nitrite, total nitrogen, orthophosphates, total phosphorus, pH, and temperature. And as you all know, temperature is a really critical um, indicator of water quality. So Robbie's gonna show you all the application itself, but here's just really quick information on how to access it. If you visit our website um, on the RiverNet page, you'll receive, um, you'll find a form and you fill out that form and you'll get a link for account creation. And once you create an account, you can verify your email address and you'll, an you'll end up on a landing page that looks like this. And Robbie will talk a little bit more about that. So just a few next steps I wanna mention. Um, this is our beta release of our application uh, for sharing data. Um, and we're really interested in your feedback. So that's part of the purpose of having this community conversation is we are really interested in your feedback and how we can make it work for the community. We are gonna be releasing improved visualizations. So ways to visualize and understand the data in a way that makes sense for everyone um, for trend analysis. We're going to be adding additional diagnostics like our riparian songbird surveys and aquatic um, insect surveys. And then what Bob's going to talk about, this is really exciting, um, predictive capabilities. So um, using our monitoring program, we'll be able to share information on um, a total water budget and freshwater forecasts. So Bob will talk about that in his section. So before I pass it off to Robbie, I just want to emphasize um, how important community involvement is uh, for this program. We're interested in forming a RiverNet user group. So what that means is just people that are getting on the application and sending us feedback about how we can make it work, um, like tweaking pieces of it, um, adding more data layers, things like that. Um, because this is an application that we've built, we, we have control over it to make it work for the community. And I just want to highlight um, really quickly that this is one of our three community science cooperatives. So RiverNet looks at watershed health, um, but we have two other community science cooperatives in different stages. WildNet, um, which looks at wildlife community health and is part of our coexistence strategy program. And LandNet, which is a partnership with Western Sustainability Exchange, looking at landscape health and agroecosystem health. So we've got an application um, built on top of that as well. All right, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Robbie Roberts. Um, he's going to do a walkthrough of the application. And as Max and I mentioned, um, if you have questions, you can pop them in the chat and we can address them as they come up. Thanks, Tori. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear me okay. Yes, yep. no, maybe. We can hear okay. you. Yes. Okay, great. Well, as I mentioned, my name is Robbie Roberts. I'm the Chief Technology Officer at, at Yerk. Um, I've been with Yerk now for about three years when my wife and I moved in into Bozeman, uh, even though it's really like coming back home because I grew up on a, a small farm in Western Wyoming. Uh, I have a, a traditional data processing background. And that's really what my focus is, is on the, the computing platform, the storing it and access of the data that Tori, Tori described. And, um, and I'm excited to be able to, to meet and interact with you today. As, as Tori also mentioned, you know, important part of community science is collaboration. And just having built applications before, it's only as good, really, I believe, as the user feedback. You know, how are users looking and accessing the system? Are they getting, you know, does it have the functionality as well as the data that they need? So again, we really need that, um, you know, that feedback. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Looks like you're muted, Robbie. I'm not sure if you meant to be.
Robbie's back. Good. Can you hear us now, Robbie? Hmm. Max, it sounds like the screen share function disconnected Robbie. <laughs> yeah, something happened. He when we were getting set up, he uh yeah, it worked fine. Audio. I just nope. stopped sharing and now the I can it unmutes. Maybe you, you could initiate the screen share, Max. You know what I could do, Robbie, is I could I could get on the application and share it and, and you could kind of walk through that way. Would that be helpful? <laughs> he went off again. I think that's a good idea, uh, Tori or Max. Maybe you could initiate the screen share. I, I can do it. I'll just get on the application. Robbie, does that sound okay? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't know if it's part of the recording or I don't really see an option to not share my audio when I do that. So yeah, if you can go ahead and do that. Yeah, no problem. We'll blame Zoom and uh, the pandemic. Oh, oh, anyway, maybe this will work. There is, I'm just resharing. And there is a option to share the audio and I turned that off. Oh, yep. Okay, so can you still hear me? Yes. Oh, awesome. <laughs> I don't know why that didn't come up, you know, when we did it initially, but anyway. Um, so you can all see the my initial sign-in screen, correct? Yes. Yep. Okay, so this is the landing page to be able to access the data. And again, just a little bit of, of background, this is a web application. Everything with regards to the RiverNet and its data is stored in the cloud. What that means or why that's important is, you know, right now we've just, you know, got relatively few users. But as we add more users, add more people, uh, then it's really just a matter of clicking a few buttons and I've enabled that capability. Also on the back end, you know, the data is secure, but it also, as I need more storage, I uh, need to access it. It just makes it available. Because one of the things I noticed as I joined Yerk, there is just so much information regarding our, our environment. But being able to get and access it is sometimes a, a challenge. And it's all what I call silos of, of information. You know, there's all these pockets of information and not really mechanisms in place to be able to share it. So what we've done really focused on over the past year is a, a back-end platform which we're calling either epic or yellowstone net and it's all about sharing sharing the data so this application is just one way of accessing that data you know some of the other ways that really the data is coming from other feeds like the river net sensors that uh, tori was mentioning we're also incorporating uh, satellite data from sources such as, you know, a Google Earth engine, or also, you know, other types of data, uh, like our field techs, when they're taking the, the water quality samples, you know, we're really set up a system so we can handle or what I call it, ingest different types of information. Um, so that's, is just important to kind of, as we talk about the data, if there's data sources that we want to add or bring in that we think is a is applicable on help, well, then we've, that's part of interaction and feed that we need because if we identify those other additional data sources, we've designed a system to be able to bring that in. Um, and the other part is part of accessing the data, the data is not only, you know, backed up, stored safely, but also it's secure. So we've added a, um, this sign-in screen and, and as part of that, what that allows us to do is this initial page that I see, which is, you know, the home page, is customized specifically to me. And as you see, you know, on the top right, that identifies, you know, or can tell me that I'm logged in and what type of access that I have. Now, like these visualizations, um, 
well, maybe back up for just a minute. There's three components to this application that we've set up so far. The first one, these are three tabs. We have da dashboard visualizations. We have a map view and a tabular view. And I will get into the, those details of, of what they are. But at a high level, this visualizations tab that starts off, this is designed to be able to visualize or look at the data very quickly that I am most interested in, you know, and using tools like charts and graphs, being able to look at and see, you know, some of the recent trends or see the data very quickly, you know, as soon as I log in. Um, as Tori mentioned, one of the things that we're in the process of really focusing and designing enhancements for is the visualizations. You know, initially we, we focused on the data and getting the data, making sure it's up to date and working on those processes. Because really, you know, I, I've always harped on this a lot with Bob, it's all about the data. If the data is not good or up to date, the rest of the application is really useless. So that's why I focused on, we focused on initially is getting the data set up. So now we're really looking at tweaking the application, adding the enhancement that the user see. Um, so on this screen, we can add or you know, really customize these, these charts according to what you wanna see. What I have set up uh, as part of this is this first visualization, it's really looks at the pH for, for the, what I call groups of features like a watershed. Um, in this case, I just picked one of the water quality parameters, uh, you know, pH. So just by clicking on these three dots, I can actually pop up a screen and it allows me to select other parameters. Um, so I can see a group of information very, very quickly. The other types of visualizations that we're you know, supporting or have been initially designed is I can zoom in on specific areas that I am interested. In this case, I have a discharge graph of Muharran Creek. And and this shows uh, the last 30 days of our discharge data. So I can see how that's changed um, over the, the last month. And another, I can select different parameters. Like in this case, I selected temperature. So uh, again, I can see a graph of that data over time. So back to just kind of the overview of purpose of the, this visualizations tab is to be able to see trends and look at the data quickly that I am most interested in. And we can custom, you can, as a user, we'll be able to customize, you know, which data sources you want to look at and how you want to look at. Um, so really before I go on to the other, uh, other tabs, are there, Tori, are there any questions in the, the chat at this point? Yes, there is a question um, from Adam. And this question is probably for you, Robbie, and for Bob. Um, what checks and balances do you have to ensure that the data is good data, um, any calibration metrics or precision measures? Yeah, I actually will, I mean, probably defer to Bob on, because that's more of a science, I guess, in what our protocols are. I mean, we have established protocols and, and the data is reviewed as part of the process of uploading it or ingesting it into Epic. So, but that's a great question. I mean, because I mentioned before, the data is only as good or the application is only as good as the, the accuracy of the data. So Bob, did you want to comment? Yeah, I mean, that's a, of course, Adam, that's a great question and one that we take real seriously. So we use adopted protocols either for, you know, the Energy Lab protocol through DEQ or USGS, um, you know, um, uh, rating curve protocols to convert stream height to discharge. And, you know, there's a, there's a lot of work involved in that and expense. So, you know, we're, uh, we have measures of all that. And, uh, those are the kinds of things that we're adding in version two. So measures of uncertainty, that is primarily precision, not, not bias. But also I think a, a hallmark that I wish everyone would try to adhere to, and that is, you know, how good are your predictions based on what's observed? So those are things we're building in in, in later versions, but 
all our field protocols are either posted online and we pretty much adopt everyone's standards. And we do have uncertain measures to report. They're just not part of the platform yet. Yeah. Thanks, great question, Adam. All right, Any, anything else or should I go on to the, the map view? I think we're ready for the map view. Thanks, Robbie. Okay. Um, just a quick description of the tabs. Again, the, the visualizations is for the, the summary and trend analysis. The map view is where I look at the detailed data. And, and in the tabular view uh, is where, if I want to have access to the raw data and be able to download it, this is where we're going to put that. That's part of the functionality we don't have fully implemented, um, but all the data is available on our website. But that's, again, just kind of a high level view of the, the functionality. Um, now, so I just switched to, to the map view. Um, the map and really what we we're trying to do with our, our design goal is to be able to, so there's a lot of information. Okay, so how do we navigate and get to the information that I want to have access to? Map-based viewing is very, one of the common ways to do that. And for those of you familiar with like GIS systems, like ArcGIS or QGIS, the functionality we've tried to mimic is really, or that is the functionality we've tried to, to mimic. So we have the map on the left, and then on the right is an information panel, where in this case we have, I call a weather widget, weather information. Um, and actually if I double click on that, um, the map view, there is weather forecast and history. And I just realized, did that pop up actually show? Yes, it did. Okay. So we can see here, not only a detailed forecast, but also the, the history um, behind it. So again, trying to find different sources of information that are very valuable, valuable as I'm looking at the, the details. Um, and on the bottom right, that is uh, where we'll have some visualizations, you know, specific to the data that we're looking at. Uh, but again, going over to the, the map part of it, uh, the base of the map, as you see in the bottom left, is using Google Maps. Um, part of what that allows me to do is uh, I can look at the map in uh, kind of a flat or with, with terrain and with the label so I can see where all these different sensors are located. And maybe, the, I guess just to make a quick point is the bottom left is the map legend. So you can see the yellow, those are our water quality sites. In the blue triangle are our water quantity sites. Uh, I personally like the satellite view just, I don't know, just, I guess I, I like that orientation and being able to see the really the live details. As I mentioned, and I'm just going to quickly look at all these, explain these different options. This here is what we call layers. And and it's really using GIS methodology. In other words, uh, each set of data is organized into layers. So I, on this map, I have water quality data and I have water quantity. If I want to just look at my water quantity, then I just deselect that site. And now all I see is water, water quantity sites. And obviously, if I switch, now I'm only seeing the water quality sites. And what this allows me to do is now I can see those different locations. So I'm going to go to this site right here. It looks like it's both a water quality as and a water quality site. So I click on that. And now that icon splits, and I can select which one do you want to look at the water quantity or the water quality. So I'm just going to select the uh, the water quantity, and that pops up with the, the detail of, by default, is the last seven, what we call, observations. So the last time one of our techs downloaded the data from the sensor was on September 23rd. And now we see the temperature and the, the discharge for that. If I want to go to a different site, I can just scroll the map, and, and I click on on that site. Well. 
and the data is, is updated. Um, so that's really the functionality of, of how the map navigation works is I can navigate and look at the data very quickly using a vis visualization tool. Now, as I scroll around on a map, um, if I want to go, if I want to change that to be my, my default, then I would click on this button right here on the top right. That's my save user preferences. So that will save all the changes, not only to my map navigation, but also any of the visualizations, which means the next time I come back into the application, that's the state that it's going to be. So again, trying to, you know, little things like this, trying to make it customizable and, and easy to use. Uh, this next button is my home button. So as I scrolled around, I have saved my initial map center. And as I click on that, it just navigates directly to there or resets it back to that, that point in time. Uh, we're in the process now of really combining these two icons, uh, that magnifying glass and the, and the triangle, into a single search function. And what this allows me to do is we is quickly find a specific. So if I want to look at uh, the sites on, on Mill Creek, so I just start typing, and now I can navigate directly to the East Fork on, on Mill Creek. Um, and another, I get navigating over to um, on the bottom right, the information panel. If I want to see a, a, a visualization, I just now can see these. In this case, the default is just the last seven observations. Uh, now I can see that in a line chart. And I can customize depending on the data, whether it's I want to see it in a line chart, a pie chart, or uh, a bar chart. Again, this is just our, our first, first iteration of, the, of these visualizations. So that's part of what we need you know, feedback for is just, OK, does this make sense? Do I need to tweak this, make this easier? Or, or maybe this is kind of confusing, so how can we simplify that? Um, so that's basically what it's going to cover as part of the, the map view. Uh, Tori, are there any questions about the map view? I don't see any in the chat, but I'm curious if you could pull up a water quality site just to show folks what that looks like. Yep, that's a good question. Sorry, I didn't. So I'll just. Well, I guess an easy way to do it. I know back on. Uh, um, so I know I have Cedar Creek and okay, so now we see our last uh all the observations or water quality samples we've done this year and what the uh, the results are for, for each of the parameters. And if I want to see the visualization over here, uh, then I can I can see that as, as well. Um, so any other, I guess, questions is that so I can scroll down and see all seven. So back to the beginning of the year as well. Uh, we have a question. I think this is probably another question for Bob um, from Adam. Can you remind me of your sampling frequency? Um, water temp is hourly or daily, discharge is daily, and water quality is several times a month. Right. Yeah. At the beginning of the season, it's every two weeks for water quality. And then we move to three weeks at lower base flows. And the, uh, the uh, onset sensors that measure uh, stream height converted to discharge and um, temperature, I think, is every 15 minutes. But we download hourly and convert it to daily, uh, you know, a max and min daily. 
Yeah, we actually collect, it's logged every hour. And I think the important point is, you know, on, on what we're doing that's, that's, you know, similar to the gold standard of USGS Streamgate stations is, uh, you know, real time or near real time turnaround, especially on the water quality data. We, you know, it, <laughs> when things go well, we usually turn the data around in uh, one or two days, you know, versus sometimes there's delay times of six months or a year or two on water quality. And uh, so, and of course our sensors are Bluetooth download, but if we had more funding, we'd put a cell phone modem on so they'd transmit in real time like a USGS stream gauge station. We call that the necessary turnaround time. And sometimes it's uh, pretty often, sometimes it's only every year, but uh, that's, that's, uh, that's a tough parameter to uh, define is the temporal resolution or the turnaround time. So I don't know if that was included in your question or not, uh, Adam. Um, we have a couple more questions in the chat. Um, and then I wonder if it makes sense to hand it over to you, Bob, uh, so we can talk about our next steps since we're running a little short on time. Unless Robbie, is there anything else you wanted to share about the, the platform? I, I, the only thing I was going to share is just the tabular view, just showing, you know, this is the data that I have access to, but also on the platform we've been working with, uh, or WSE and the ranchers to, to generate other um, other types of data. And again, that's just really showing, you know, not only other partnerships, but also other types of data that the platform can ingest and, and we can work with. So that, that was it. Awesome. Um, one more quick question. Are the temperature on Robbie's screen um, so Robbie's previous screen, is that average temperatures, Bob? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, on the water quality, yes. It's all average temperature for that day. Yeah, we have the detailed data, but as part of the presentation, just to make it easier to view on the map, is currently we average that on a daily basis. Yeah, great question. And in future versions, we can have, you know, uh, temperature max and temperature min every day. We'll have pull downs where you can go back and compare it to the last year at the same time or the average the last couple of years. So these are all things we're working on for future versions. Well, and that's part of the, maybe the feedback we also need is, okay, what yep. things do you want to see? If there's something that you're gonna find most, you know, most helpful, then let, let us know that as well. Exactly. Great. And, and question from Sarah. Um, yes, we do have a sensor at uh, Six Mile Creek where it meets the Yellowstone. Yep. Um, yeah. yeah. And awesome. of course, I mean, it's, it's on here right now. It's dry, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, just because of the sensor location. But. All right. Um, Robbie, thank you so much um, for walking us through that. Um, if folks have other questions about the application, we can get to that at the end. I do want to hand it off uh, to Bob so he can talk about kind of what's coming next for the RiverNet program as a whole. And Joe, thank you for offering um, up your riverbank for us to put a sensor on. Saw that in the chat too. Thank you. All right, um, Bob, I'll share my screen so I've got the slides for you. Thanks. All right, so uh, we've got Dr. Bob Crabtree. He's gonna talk about um, kind of what's coming up next for RiverNet. Go ahead, next slide. Um, Robbie made a really good point I wanna emphasize, and that is, you know, when we started to build this um, platform, it became real apparent to me anyway, because I had to have my head beat against the wall a few times on not just the quality of the data, but that it be shared. So we were really, it was very difficult to find um, a platform for data storage that is built to be shared. You know, and there's a lot of, um, you might say profit, for-profit versions of that or exclusionary type versions. So we actually worked with Microsoft and a, and a, a group out of Australia to actually build this 
um, platform from the bottom up. And we had to actually redo a lot of it because our goal here really is data sharing. And we had some major delays on, on the funding for the platform, actually a, a corporation and its CTO had promised to build this two years ago and it didn't get delivered. So we are a little behind and your comments are well taken, Adam or whoever. Uh, we have a whole lot of things like alert systems, historical comparisons, uncertainty measures that we all have done. We just haven't added them yet to our platform. So anyway, to back up a little bit, um, how did this all come about? Well, we did have a summit almost exactly four years ago at Mammoth Hot Springs. We called Envision Yellowstone. And it really was the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the execution of the new five-year strategy that we are now ending. Uh, it was a 2016 to 2021 strategic plan. And we really wanted to take our um, long-term data sets, our big belief in research, taking advantage of natural and policy experiments and long-term monitoring and go, how can we put this science to work? How can we use it to make data-driven decisions? So out of that three-day summit where we had private thought leaders from all across the US and uh, is three phases of our three programs, assessment phase, monitoring phase, and prediction phase. And the three programs we adopted were essentially a network of, you might say technology and people for uh, land, water, and wildlife. And we started with the RiverNet um, uh, program because it was, we were told that was the most important issue based on our assessment of the many, many surveys in the Yellowstone ecosystem. And then of course, um, each one of our programs needs a data delivery data platform. And we built this massive underlying platform called EPIC, which is crazy acronym. So I apologize, but it stands for ecosystem prognosis, um, impacts and information cooperative. And so various applications are built on top of that Yellowstone Net platform. So Yellowstone Net is people using the Epic platform. So the RiverNet application sits on top of Epic. So does the Rancher dashboard app that we built for the Western Sustainability Exchange as part of the LandNet program and WSE's Resilient Ranching program. So next slide. We, um, and I want to mention that, you know, you, you might want to understand what assessment means. And a good example of that is the recently um, completed uh, climate assessment by Kathy Whitlock and her team, including USGS and other um, organizations. In fact, in that uh, recommendation is to move beyond assessment to the next phase. And RiverNet was called out as the monitoring platform that's exemplary of, of what the next step beyond a climate assessment is. So we also five years ago cut up the Yellowstone ecosystem into you know, various watershed units or catchments. And these are HUC sixes that were used for the climate assessment. We have a very similar design. I remember you know, we, we, we all talked about this a lot a few years ago, it was a lot of fun because you can divide things up in different ways. And that's the beauty of these non-overlapping catchments. In fact, in the upper, upper the upper, upper Yellowstone, or we call the Yellowstone headwaters from Carter's Bridge up, there's, you know, about 100 different catchments that you'll see in an upcoming slide that is the spatial subdivision of our model. So um, next slide. So I, I kind of like to talk about assessment, monitoring and predictions as building from the bottom up. So although I'm, I'm using kind of the uh, the Olympics, the bronze medal, the silver medal, and the gold medal, because I really believe that predictions are the gold. We can't get there without a basic assessment of what it is that's important to monitor. So this was done at the beginning of the uh, Envision Yellowstone Summit, uh, talking to federal agencies, NGOs, and you know, a place like Paradise Valley, to be honest, has been surveyed to death. So we kind of know what the important issues are and water, bubbled up to the top, no surprise. Even though a lot of the work of Yerk in the past has been more wildlife and land and things like that. But so we, we had to learn a lot. Um, and of course, what we also like about the assessment phase is that it should be ongoing. For example, ex important exercises like the GYE climate assessment adds to that 
assessment of what's important to measure. And I call measurements, not indicators, but diagnostics, because we're really about health. Next slide. A monitoring phase, it, you know, we started with RiverNet and we're now in our um, end of our fourth year. Um, we did an initial pilot study in 2018 that turned out pretty well. And it's important when you embark on research and long-term monitoring to have a kind of a, a pilot year to learn a lot of lessons from. And we started with, um, of course, water quantity and then seven measures of water quality, including uh, the all important temperature parameter. And uh, now we're expanding to add additional diagnostics such as riparian vegetation that we've measured the last two years, uh, songbird breeding uh, point counts, breeding bird surveys. Uh, we have a protocol we're playing with for algae. We have a new um, cell phone app that automatically identifies uh, macroinvertebrates or aquatic insects into their major families. And it's you know, only gonna get better the more people use it. So we'll, we can talk about that at a later time too in a seminar. Spawning red count, stream bank conditions, you know, it's endless. And we've heard this from end users is beyond water quality and water quantity, what's important to measure. So we're, uh, we'll be adding those things as uh, we have more bandwidth and funding available, as we are also moving on to other um, watersheds within the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Next slide. All right, what I like to call the goal, the predictions. And that's really how you can tell how good your science is, is uh, your the success in your ability to predict compared to real data. <clears throat> and, and we need this because that's really what data-driven decision-making is all about is, you know, can we predict uh, tomorrow or a year from now the consequences of our actions today? So, you know, really what prediction's about on the ground is planning, smart planning, like adaptation to drought. So we, at the summit and some of my previous work, um, has really focused on two um, not very common forms of predictions or predictive ecology. Short-term forecasts, 36 hour and five day, and the gold of the gold is what I call what if scenarios. And I'll talk about that in just a bit. Next slide. This is probably the best way to understand where we're going with all of RiverNet and our other programs and what we call data-driven, the dis decision-making and adaptation to climate impacts and human uh, impacts on the ground. Um, the assessment was after World War II that the public demanded short-term weather forecasts and the scientific community, academia agencies all worked together to make it happen. And what you see here is one measure of accuracy, which is called the skill. That's what meteorologists kind of call accuracy is their forecasting skill of a 36 hour forecast. And it went from about Let's see, it looks like about 24% accuracy in 1955 to about 90% today of a 36 hour forecast. That's pretty amazing. I mean, that may be one of the biggest triumphs of how science and technology and everybody working together to really can provide decision making and planning. And that's why the Weather Channel and, and, and things like that are so incredibly important. And, I, mean, I wake up in the morning and look at the weather forecast for today and tomorrow. That's the 36 hour forecast, by the way, is today when you get up in the morning and tomorrow. Um, and there are three critical reasons for this. And these are the same fundamental principles we're using for RiverNet and the freshwater forecasting system we're building. And I'm gonna stop and say again, none of this will work unless we have a standardized, transparent, credible, repeatable monitoring program. You know, these models only work if you can get the data into them as fast as needed. All the rest is, you might say academic, you know, you, you publish a paper about it, but if the public is gonna use a system, it's gotta look like this. Okay, so I know that I'm coming on strong here, but I get excited about this stuff. So the real three critical reasons why weather forecasting was successful is the density of sensors. Thousands of MET stations are put up across the US and the world after World War II. 
And that's a big re reason why we have accurate 36 hour and, and five day forecasts today. The other reason is models, models that learn, mechanistic process-based models, not correlative model based on what I like to call statistical magic, but actual uh, modeling of the actual process. For example, like a physics-based model of uh, um, a water flow, a routing model over the landscape. So we can actually, we, we look at the mechanics of, of predictable phenomena like gravity. And, and then the, these models ingest data in real time and they're rerun and calibrated and validated at the same time. So it's where theory meets mechanistic process-based models where data are ingested as soon as they're available. That's how we got at this accuracy. And the third reason is we all work together. We all share data and we're not afraid to be wrong. I, I went to a weather forecasting a conference once and I just couldn't believe about the speakers were like proud of the fact they were proven wrong because someone else had a better model. So those are the three reasons I would argue that weather forecasting was successful and why ecological forecasting and it will be successful. Next slide. So what we're really trying to do in our 36 hour forecasts and we're already cranking these out in a model we've already built is discharge, you see here on the right, stream flow, uh, turbidity, which is highly correlated with sediment transport in this model we've uh, developed. It's an open source model called SWAT Plus developed by USDA, stands for Soil Water Assessment Tool, and water temperature, we all wanna know. So we've actually built a total water budget for the entire upper Yellowstone watershed from Carter's Bridge up. You'll see here depicted in, uh, in green. And we've done this at high resolution using past historic data, uh, mainly from USGS stream gauge stations. And we're getting some excellent results. And we haven't even brought in our empirical data, which is focused on putting sensors at the mouth of tributaries, often where we don't have any good data, but that's where the land impacts often occur, is at the tributary level, for example, like Mill Creek or Big Creek or Blacktail Deer Creek, which by the way is heavily, um, uh, there's a lot of sensors there. So we pulled that out as an example. And we've also done some preliminary scenarios. So you see here a, a plus two degree warming of air temperature. And what that means as is in its effect on stream flow, sediment and water temperature. So I really don't wanna go into the model, but it's a, uh, there's three major challenges and so we can go, well, let, let's go to the next slide. Hey, Bob, I just want to give you a heads up. We're nearing the top of the hour. Okay. All right. Anyway, uh, I just won't go into the, the details of how we have built the model over the last year, but you compile the data, you, uh, you know, subdivide it into many, many small catchments you'll see here, and then you calibrate it based on past data. Next slide. And we've mainly used, of course, USGS data at these five stations. And there's about 18 USGS data sets at catchments that we're incorporating now. And the really uh, challenges of what we're dealing with is computational efficiency. So we're parallelizing it so it works on the cloud. Because every time we run this model, there are thousands of parameters that must be estimated. Next slide. Um, and let's just go to the next one here because I, I don't want to run over time. I just want to say that um, what we're starting to work on now is um, bringing our short-term forecasts of temperature, turbidity, and discharge to the platform. So we'll be able to broadcast next year these 36-hour and five-day forecasts for those three parameters. You'll see that in a future version, probably version three. And then we're really working on what I get really excited about and they're called what if scenarios. So imagine a year from now, you pull up the RiverNet app and there's a screen like you're looking at now and on the left side is all the different climate parameters, increase in growing season, increasing in evapotranspiration, uh, a, a lower snowpack, a drought scenario where you vary precipitation. And on the right side are land use activities. For example, adding or taking away crop circles, adding wells, bringing in beaver impoundments, whether real or uh, simulated, and then rerunning the model to see what happens to the watershed. 
which is why you need a total water budget. So that's a quick run through of what's coming next. Thank you very much, Bob. Um, it's a really great overview. I've learned a lot. Um, uh, this, this has been informative, not being super familiar with RiverNet, just having uh, helped out a little bit early on with that water quality component and building that. But um, this looks like a very powerful tool and a, and a great way to get a snapshot of what's going on in the watershed. Um, we are at the top of the hour, so I understand if some people have to drop off uh, for other work or personal needs, um, but uh, we still have time. The folks here at York have, are willing to answer questions if people want to stay on and have a discussion, so I'll, I'll open it up to that. Yeah, if anyone um, wants to stay on to talk about um, details about the model um, or questions about how to collaborate and contribute to the project, um, definitely stay on. So um, all three of us are available. And I also want to mention too that if uh, there'll probably be another seminar in a month when uh, uh, York's postdoc Dean Cook is here, who's been building the SWAT Plus um, and USGS ModFlow model to develop this total water budget. So we can defer some of those questions till then and maybe focus more on the platform. Uh, we got a note from uh, Joe uh, thanking us and thank you, Joe, for all of your wonderful support. Um, and a couple questions from Adam. Bob, were you able to see the questions in the chat? Might be oh, easier I just pull them up, you. yes. Okay, cool. Let's see, what is the resolution grain of the water budget predictions, six refiner? I think we've divided, I think the final count was about 80 watershed units and catchments within the watershed above Carter's Bridge. So this is super high resolution, Adam. We really wanna get down to the tributary level. And I don't, I guess your next question is about water budget versus water balance. It's, it's actually both and we're, you know, spending a lot of time on redoing the weather uh, meteorological, dividing it down to these small catchments and also parallelizing it to run on a cloud because, you know, you can imagine how many months it would take to run this on a workstation for one model run for one simulation. And also um, uh, linking it to a better below ground model. And we've chosen GW flow, which is kind of a Bailey down at Colorado State is working on that. It's a modification of USGS's mod flow. So does that help answer your question, Adam? Oh, I guess you can't, okay. Yeah, I, I think I can talk. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, it does, yeah. Absolutely, yeah. If you want to unmute, yeah, feel free, please. Cool, yeah, I was just curious because there's been obviously a lot of water balance work done in the Yellowstone, like in the cave group. Um, so yeah. Good to know that you're doing both budgets and balances because I think that ET part is, is huge. Yeah, it's going to take some time. And we're actually redoing the snowmelt runoff model. Actually, SWAT Plus's snowmelt runoff is actually pretty poor, as is its water temperature model. So we're redoing all that and working closely with all the SWAT Plus developers in the US. So, Adam, we'd love to have you when uh, Dean Cook gives his uh, update probably next month. And I think John and Sarah, it'd be great if you two could be there too. Um, we've got some pretty exciting results and we're getting really accurate um, uh, discharges at each of the small um, catchments upstream from uh, Carter's Bridge. So we're pretty excited. Anyone else wanna unmute and ask a question? Feel free. Um, I have a quick question, I guess. Um, the data is all really nicely visualized and summarized in, on the application. Um, is there a way for an individual or, um, you know, another research scientist to, you know, act, you know, have access to the, to the raw data if they wanted to incorporate it into a study of their own? Yes. 
we're yeah we're, i'll go ahead and answer that i mean please. that's what we want to do with the tabular view is really make that as easy as possible to do that you know, in the meantime again we it's kind of on request so if somebody wants to see some data i can provide that uh but you know, your point is a great point that's what our end goal is we just don't have all those mechanisms in place yet okay good to know thank you yeah and you can actually access um the 2019 and 2020 water quantity data as an excel spreadsheet um daily averages on our website to to easily download Sorry, this is Adam, but that's, do you have the actual raw data or just the daily? Uh, we don't have the raw data on our website, but we do have it that we can share. Okay, that's just upon request. Great. Mm -hmm. Correct. It's just a huge spreadsheet, <laughs> so it's not on our but, website. Yeah, we're, we're all about data sharing for sure. Uh, what we probably will do is request who it is that um, requested and what their use of it's going to be very similar to uh, what was done for uh, um, the Harvard group that developed um, um, air monitoring systems, flux towers. We call it the WAFSI model. <laughs> so we really, we really want to encourage collaboration. So um, that we will probably ask folks, you know, what their use of it will be so we can work together, but it'll be available. I have another question if no one else does. Um, you bet, Adam. Yeah, just uh, it seems like you know what I've learned to date about any type of I guess, understanding of what's happening and predictions is you need a lot of data um, spatially, but especially temporally. I mean, do you think this is something that York will be able to support greater than 10 years? Um, so we could actually have that wealth of data to dig back and, and do you know, powerful trend analyses um, and, and hopefully better predictions? Or do you kind of taking this one bite at a time and, and thinking more like in two or five year intervals? I think both, Adam. I mean, you really asked the million dollar question that every small nonprofit has to face because I would argue that 99% of starts across the US in any organization are usually become one-offs. So we all need sustained funding for long-term monitoring and research. I mean, and it's, that's why most of research done in the US are two or three year studies. So uh, the, the short answer is if we don't all work together uh, and cover the minimum costs, we'll become another one-off like everyone else. <laughs> I think you know but what I mean. we will, You know, I just can add from a dis system design, because it's on the cloud, we have the capability to do whatever's needed. So we're not constrained by the system. So it's really the issues that Bob just addressed that's going to keep us from doing it. You know, this is all transferable and modified. It's all open source. I mean, you know, we're, we're data socialists. <laughs> is that kind of what you're getting at, Adam? Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, okay. just, you know, hopefully, hopeful, hopeful that this data, um, yeah, just becomes uh, very, very deep. Because I, I see incredible usefulness, um, especially with a lot of the TRIBs. You know, clearly the USGS doesn't have that much going on in TRIBs. We tend to be focused on main stems for our, you know, uh, um, data records. And so all the TRIB data I think you guys are collecting is going to be incredibly valuable. Yeah, that's the open niche we saw. We really don't want to do anything redundant. For example, if there had been another total water budget bill at this resolution, we never would have done it. But you also bring up, Adam, a perfect example of the problem. I mean, um, is working together and, and what solves that problem. I mean, accuracy of our model is pretty stunningly good right now. And we haven't even brought in the tributary data yet to further calibrate it at that you know, high resolution huck. But we couldn't have gotten here without the USGS data. I mean, it's, it, we calibrated everything we could using that data. So again, we couldn't even have built the system if it wasn't for kind of the sustained federal funding that, uh, you know, we have access to because it's open source.
All right, any other questions from folks? Um, I really hope that everyone on this call today signs up to get on the application. Um, this is our website to learn more about the program. You can also, of course, follow us on social media for updates about, um, you know, as Bob mentioned, um, potential more upcoming outreach events to learn more about what's coming and how you can be involved. Yeah, I'd like to thank everyone as well. Um, Tori, would you mind really quickly dropping the link to the application or where people can sign up in the chat box so they can grab it before we close off? Yeah, great um, idea. Let me grab that. And um, yeah, I'm excited to see how this project moves forward and, and uh, the uh, information it'll bring to this really important component of health and well-being of this ecosystem. And thank you, uh, PCEC, for hosting these awesome community conversations. I'm excited to attend more in the future. Yes, there'll be another one uh, in a week. So. <laughs> cool. Thanks. All right. Okay. Like we're done. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thanks. Bye.